the best thing about Peloton in early sobriety is that you end up having a lot of free time in your hands that you don't know what to do with. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because if you are drinking at night, that kind of consumes every night. And all of a sudden you're sober and your mind is reeling and you're like, oh my God, what am I going to do? I actually, in that first year of sobriety, would get in my car and drive to the gym at 6.30 at night after I fed my kids just to get out of the house and have something to do. But having a bike in a community right in your own house, it's such a good way to kind of get healthy and keep your mind off of other things. It's more than just your output, more than a bike. When you hear your shout out, you know it's all right. Put on your magic pants and let's go. We're cruising into the power zone. Clip in, set yourself free. Come on and take a ride with me. You know what you need to know and what's it all about. Everything you need, it's on the clip out. Welcome to the clip out episode 142. This is Crystal O'Keefe. And this is Tom O'Keefe. And I guess I should say if I sound different, it's because we are not together physically. I should specify (laughs) physically together. (laughs) Yes. And it's temporary because you make it sound like we're not together at all. Like I'm trying to create a a clickbait moment. So, people. (laughs) oh, my God, did you hear? Well, unless you put it in the title, no one's going to know what that means. Oh, (laughs) damn it. That's true. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) so uh, i am in los angeles for work makes me sound way more important than i actually am and so you have to hear me on on uh i'm on skype a phone holy cow it is magic (laughs) although you keep messing with your cord so it's uh making noise you gotta sit still oh here i'll hold it differently okay i wasn't holding it so i think whenever i shift around because you know how animated i am Yes, I do. Actually. (laughs) Yes, that's better. Thank you. So uh, what do you have in store for people this week? Well, since we record on a different day now, for those of you who might care about the background, I just got off the Peloton earnings call. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about all the updates on lawsuits. We're going to have lots of content updates. We're going to talk about the winner of the clip out challenge and lots of little stuff like that. Awesome. Well, I guess uh, before we get to all that shameless plugs, don't forget that we're available on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and uh, wherever you're getting them, you should be sure and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And of course, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash the clip out. And while you're there, like the page and join the group and uh, you can leave us a review there or on Apple Podcasts, whichever works for you. We'll we'll accept either. We're not proud. Yeah, you just won't read the ones from the Facebook because you are very, very stubborn. (laughs) I'm just trying to to plow through all the Apple Podcasts one and then move over to. (laughs) As I said, though, now we're at two and a half years. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I thought we'd run out of reviews by now, but luckily people keep leaving them. Would you like to hear one? He said, trying to change the topic. (laughs) I would. I would like to hear one. This is from RSA 999. Hmm. In light of the current viruses, it sounds like a coronavirus. <laughs> I'm sure they'll love hearing that. <laughs> they'll I'm just have, saying. They'll pick out a new leaderboard name. I don't know. It's a leaderboard name. It might just be a iTunes name. No, I just meant they should pick out coronavirus as their leaderboard name. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so it says, my first real podcast, and I love it. Started listening about four weeks ago after deciding the tedium of news radio or bad music was too much. Only a short commute, so can take a few drives to get through each episode. I really love the information and how transparent Crystal and Tom are. Thank you, guys. Another not done before activity prompted by Peloton. Final note, Crystal's laugh just makes me smile. It will brighten your day. So there Aww. you go. Aww. So that was very nice. And then uh, also don't forget, you know, we throw a lot of information at you every week with all the links and articles and, and things of that nature. So if you want to stay up to date on that, a real easy way to do that is swing by the clipout.com. Sign up for our newsletter, which is absolutely free and worth twice as much. And you will have all that stuff sent to you in one easily digestible format every week, almost. So how about that? (laughs) So uh, I guess uh, that's it for this. Let's dig in, shall we? Sure. It's time for news of the Paladin. Well, I guess we should kick off with the results of the earnings call. How's it going? Can we retire yet? (laughs) <laughs> no, we definitely can't retire. Uh, but uh, actually, earnings are going great. 
So they have increased their subscribers yet again to 750,000. And I might be off a little bit. But the point is, is that it's up 77% for the year. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. And they think it's going to be uh, like 85% during third quarter. Wow, that's crazy. Especially yes. when, you know, so many of the uh, the naysayers were like, oh, I mean, they've already seen their bump. And yeah, yeah, no, that's not even close. And I heard some interesting things today. So a couple things of note. One, I found this fascinating. So you'll just have to humor me in my really geekdom about this. But I was really fascinated by the fact that they talked about when they recognize the revenue. So they recognize revenue when your product gets delivered. Why is that important? Because last year, when everybody was going and ordering during the holiday season, it took so long to get your item, they weren't able to recognize that revenue until third quarter. So, and right now, we just finished up second quarter because they're on a different fiscal year than the calendar year. Okay. So last year, let's say they said, okay, we're going to have 100 orders hit in Q2, and that's when we're going to recognize the revenue. Well, by the time they actually got delivered, it was in Q3 because they couldn't recognize the revenue. So that spread out the revenue, artificially inflating Q3 from last year's revenue earnings. Okay? Okay. The, the fascinating part is they have done so much with their logistics. They now have 31 warehouses across the United States that they were able to go the other direction this year. And orders they thought they weren't going to be able to recognize until Q3, they pulled into Q2. It was 6,000 orders that they did faster than they thought they would. Wow. 6,000. That's insane. Yeah, that's a lot, especially when it's, you know, like if for someone that's thinking that 6,000 doesn't sound like a whole lot, you got to remember, too, that the lowest priced item they sell is, you know, what, $2,000 essentially. So it's not like. And, and that's 6,000 orders, not $6,000. And that's just We're the right. ones they moved. That's just the ones they moved. That's a, That doesn't mean that was their entire holiday sales or anything. Totally. I was just saying like 6,000 orders might not sound too big if somebody's used to like thinking about like all the things Amazon delivers or something, but Amazon can deliver you a five or eight or 10 or $20 item. Like that's not what Peloton has going on. So it's high dollar stuff that they're moving into the other quarter. So that's, that's a lot. It's huge. They also talked about the fact that Germany is surpassing what they thought it would do. In fact, it is outpacing the original sales in the UK. So gangbuster. They also talked about the fact that they now have 96 showrooms across all the countries, all their markets. So there's 96 of those. They uh, just opened or just started a new version of their store called the Concept Store. There's two of them. And it's a regular showroom, but then they have some an additional footprint that allows them to show off their additional content, like the digital content, yoga, meditation, etc. Other highlights include strength is up three times what it was last year from user engagement. Wow. But get this, meditation is up 22 times what it was last year. <laughs> well, well, there's a lot we need to calm down about. So, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's true. I mean, it was just good news after good news after good news. Uh, user engagement is up. User churn is holding steady. It was like 0.74. And that's fantastic. Like the investors were just giddy about that number. Um, <laughs> well, they should. Be. <laughs> they absolutely should be. Let's see what else. They talked about the super studio. That's what they're calling the new studio in New York. That's going to have all the content. And I don't know what they're planning, but John Foley had that giddy sound to his voice <laughs> when he talked about it, just like he did when he was talking about what we didn't know then, but we now know was the tread right. and all of their international content. He had that same giddy tone to his voice. So whatever is coming is going to be amazing. He also touched on the social platform changes. Again, giddy. Like he called them sexy changes that we are going to be excited about. I know he thinks weird things are sexy, but man, I am like so pumped after hearing this call. There's so much stuff that is coming out in the next year. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know what it's going to be, but they are legit excited about it. So therefore, I am excited about it. Well, I think the real takeaway here, judging by his giddiness, is that 
if you ever get a chance to play poker with John Foley, <laughs> by all means, do it. <laughs> yeah, that might be true. But gosh, I love him. I love that he's so honest. Yeah. They all did such a great job. It was uh, John Foley, Jill Wentworth, and uh, William Lynch. And they all did an amazing job answering questions. And there were lots of good questions from the investors. So it was a great, great combo. So where did this fall in the day? Like, did it have time to affect stock price or was the stock market closed? And we'll see ramifications tomorrow. So the stock market has been up all week, but I think that the stock market has been up all week because of Flywheel. So it's actually down a little bit today from where it was yesterday. However, to answer your original question, the call just finished. So it's 5 p.m. Eastern. Markets are closed for the day. Okay, so if this has any impact on stock, we won't then on their shares, we won't see it until tomorrow. Yeah, if let me check the stock real quick. It might have gone up because they also like release their official written version and they do that before the call. So, you know, it remains stable the last couple of hours of the day. So gotcha. nothing nothing changed. Okay. But overall, it was a a good day for them and all the people that are saying that they can't keep this up were proven wrong yet again. That reminds me, people asked about uh, competition and they were like, you know, are you concerned? Has it affected any of your sales? No, it hasn't. And they were like, we expect to see more of it. And right now, no, we're not concerned because we think that we are well positioned. We think that none of these other companies really have a good financial backing, either they don't have a good financial backing or they're not going after the same kinds of thing. Like Nordic Track, for example, they're not going after Peloton directly because they're never going to be able to keep up the content in the same way that Peloton does. The other thing they said is that even though technically they're more profitable than they expected to be, which is to say negative profit, they said they are not changing their expectations They still expect to be profitable by 2023. They're sticking with that because they are going to continue to invest heavily in all things for accessibility for customers. They're still saying they want everyone who can have anything Peloton to get it. They don't want it to be limited by things like income. They want it to be accessible to everyone. So they are going to be investing heavily for accessibility and for experience and The other thing is that we should see with the new Super Studio opening, London definitely opening within the next year. Those two things are going to make the assets that they have kind of start to come down. Those fixed assets are going to get more out of it because that stuff's all been sitting there somewhere on their income statement balance sheet. They just haven't been able to use it yet. Gotcha. Okay. well, that's a lot to digest. (laughs) Well, I didn't say it all very well in an organized manner, but I was just listening. So. And I was very excited about it. So I took it all in very quickly. Oh, totally. And, and and again, like you're recapping this like minutes after it happened. So, yes. Yeah. So it's all you haven't really had a chance to sit down and drill down on it yourself. So uh, I guess uh, segueing into other topics. So I guess there's good news, bad news on the legal front this week. For there Peloton. is. Yeah, definitely. So I guess let's start with I always like to whenever anybody ever asks me. There's good news and bad news. Which do you want first? I always take bad news because then the good news can cheer me up. Yeah, I that's a risky gambit because not everybody has equal good news to bad news ratio. So when people say that it is a risky gambit. (laughs) But in this case, I agree with it. And the bad news is that Peloton lost a battle regarding the music licenses. I want to be very clear here because some people like automatically assume this was like terrible. We were going to have another purge. No, it doesn't mean that at all. No. All it means is one of the countersuits that Peloton had put into place got thrown out and it's a legal maneuver. You know, if it happened, it was a Hail Mary pass and it would have like fixed a lot of things very quickly that didn't happen so right it and, just means <laughs> go ahead the, oh i was gonna say and the the legal maneuver that got thrown out is they basically uh the, from my understanding peloton basically tried to say that they kind of uh for lack of a colluded. better word colluded and all kind of ganged up and said let's not license these songs and that's mean and you can't do that and that got thrown out as an argument so it's moving forward as it would have anyway, but they didn't actually like lose the suit or they didn't uh, have, you know, like you said, there's not more songs they're going to have to pull out or anything like that. It was just a procedural thing that if it had worked, it would have probably ended the suit or shut down a good chunk of it. And it just didn't happen. Absolutely. 
And I would also like to say there's a lot of people that are still very hopeful that all these old rides are going to come back, that this is all going to just go away someday and it's going to be fast. And I, I just want to say, I think that my feeling on that matter is that neither of those things is going to happen. I don't think this is going to be a quick lawsuit unless the settlement occurs. And at this moment, I don't see any kind of indication that that will happen. But these things happen behind closed doors. So that means nothing. If there is no settlement, though, this could drag on for years. And the other thing is, I don't think we're going to get those old rides back because until this is settled, those most of those songs are still question marks. And I don't know, from a business perspective, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me to be holding on to all those old rides, taking up all that space when you're constantly creating new content. It just doesn't make good business sense to me, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I mean, I think that I agree that like these things take a long time and it you could be looking at years before you have an actual legitimate resolution. And my guess is they're probably keeping these classes somewhere for their own archival purposes. But I also kind of feel like by the time this is resolved, unless there's some sort of surprise settlement, by the time this finally gets resolved, those classes are going to be so old that – I don't know that they'll really deem them worthy enough to push back into the system. That's exactly my thought process, that with a few exceptions, because there are some rides in there that will be timeless. Most of them, though, will have completely different. I mean, think about it. They're moving into a new studio. Studio is going to look completely different. Just like if you go back to the very beginning and you, you take a class from 2015, like I did two weeks ago. And holy cow. I mean, it's a different world. It's a different world. They had stuff up on the mirrors behind them. (laughs) They were being silly. Lights were different. People were, you know, it was completely different than what we see now. And so if you're looking forward two years from now, we're going to be in a totally different studio. There's going to be whatever, a different look behind it or going on, different lighting, different music setup, different, probably even different equipment setup because they keep changing monitor size and things like that in, in the studio. So all these things are going to look different. I just don't think they're going to pull all that back out. Yeah, I agree. I I think especially when that new studio hits, I think that I wouldn't be surprised if they a lot a lot of the stuff from the old studio just kind of fade away because they want to show off the new sexy studio. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. So let's segue into the good news segment of our legal portion of the show. The, (laughs) The Peloton flywheel suit was settled. Yes, yes. That was talk about surprising. Yeah, like they flywheel has just kind of been a kind of a pain about <laughs> this whole thing, I think. And all of a sudden they admitted complete faults. They said, you know what? Yeah, we did steal it and we're going to take all the tech off within 60 days. So, yeah, that's that. Boy, I wonder what that means. Like, it's not often you see a company completely acquiesce like that. So you almost can't help but think. That's indicative of something larger at play there on their part. Not like it's a surprise attack, but like, are there bigger problems coming? And they were like, yeah, just make this go away because we have other things to be concerned about. I don't know. I mean, I don't feel like their flywheel at home program really went the way that they expected it to in general. I read, obviously, you and I both respect John Mills quite a bit and his theory on it. I saw that he posted was that he feels like uh, it was probably costing them too much in legal like it just it wasn't worth what they were getting out of it because they're fairly new to the whole at home portion of things so that was for whatever it's worth that was one one take on it i haven't read tons of people's takes on it because going to the opp tends to make me angry but (laughs) um but that i thought that was a reasonable theory yeah no i think it makes sense and i guess it's kind of a version of what i was saying it's just that like are there bigger problems at play. And, right. and if they're not selling these at home bikes anyway, that it's just kind of like, why is this a fight worth having? I totally agree. And I know that we you kind of have it is one of our further down discussions, but it could be a situation that is very similar to SoulCycle where Peloton is taking a direct hit on their income, their revenue, and they just can't compete. They can't keep up. Yeah. Yeah, that could very well be. Well, then I guess while we're talking about that, since you brought it up, let's just go ahead and call an audible and talk about the Soul Cycle stuff now. Okay. Well, it's on Vox.com. And of course, it will be available on your newsletter because I will send it out. That will be three <laughs> weeks in a row. And um, <laughs> not that you're bitter about me making that joke. <laughs> no, 
I was shocked because it shows a graphic of like what their sales look like. And it's the underneath the graphic. It says it looks like Peloton is sucking up soul cycle sales through a straw. <laughs> and it does. <laughs> Like, it's bad. It's really bad, guys. Like, really bad. <laughs> yeah, I saw the headline. It was like Peloton drinks Soul Cycles milkshake. Yes. Which is a, yes. a reference to the uh, movie There Will Be Blood. If you've ever, ah. if you've never seen it, that's what they're referencing. Got it. So, you know, Soul Cycle is saying two things. Everyone thought that last year, whenever Soul Cycle was being boycotted, that this was going to have a huge effect on them. But turns out Peloton's holiday sale actually had a much bigger <laughs> impact on them. And then Soul Cycle is saying none of that is true. These numbers aren't true at all. But they won't go on record to say what's wrong about them or what's inaccurate. And from my experience with politics, that means they're lying. <laughs> right. Yeah. In the immortal words of the great philosopher Chico Marx, who are you going to believe, me or your lion eyes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So it's kind of been just like win, win, win for Peloton all week, really. Yeah, it sounds it. Except so, for the music licenses thing. Yeah. But again, like you said, that was like one small portion of a much larger thing. And if it had worked great, it's kind of like whenever you see a mur murder trial and the lawyer's like move to dismiss, like it's not going to happen. But hey, maybe. <laughs> right. If you don't ask, it for sure won't. Absolutely. You know, that's that's the attorney's job to ask the question. <laughs> Oh, so I guess we should probably also remind people that homecoming ticket sales are just around the corner. February 12th at noon Eastern. You need to be ready, people. I mean, multiple devices. Be ready to go. You need to stop giving people all your tips. I know, but I can't help it. <laughs> I know. You're too giving. <sighs> Watch now. You won't end up getting tickets. Oh, my God. <laughs> I would you're, be crushed. <laughs> you're going to be on StubHub looking for Peloton homecoming tickets. <laughs> so the new Power Zone program has been announced, and I guess it includes all of the instructors. It does. Yeah. Well, in, in all of the Power Zone instructors. All of the new instructors. Power Zone instructors, yes. Yeah. So, so there's a total of four instructors. But in the past, it has not been the case. So this one's great. It's a, a new four-week challenge or four-week program that you can do on the bike. And now you can take a class, more than one class with each of the instructors, get a good taste of what the offerings are across all of them, because they all have very different, very, very different vibes. So it's a good way to sample everybody. Awesome. Yeah, that's cool that there's finally like a little bit more variety there for people so they can partake of power zones, but not be locked into one teaching style. Yes. And I also want to mention on this note, we have a listener who brings up all the time, not in a mean way, but just like one of their things would be that they would really like for all of the Power Zone classes to have the actual format that's going to be in a ride posted before you take the class. And so thus far, none of the instructors have done it. None of the instructors have done it or have been willing to do it, even though they have been asked. But now we have Christine Diercole, who always posts it ahead of time. And the reason that's important, Tom, is because whenever you are doing power zone training, you might have a day that you want to be working on certain zones or a certain type of plan. And so to be able to have this information ahead of time makes it easier to decide, should I take this class? Should I not take this class? Oh, OK. Yeah, that's pretty convenient. So do you think that's something that she'll keep doing? Like that's something she always does? Yeah, I do, because she has always in the past been pretty darn consistent about posting the structure of her classes. So I think this will continue for power zone training. And for those of you that like to know what you're getting into with power zone training, I think it's good. Now me, on the other hand, when I do power zone training, I don't want to know because if I know, I will talk myself out of it. When somebody <laughs> tells me I have to hold zone five for like eight minutes, I'm out. But if I just get on the bike and then they say to do it, now I can do it. You know, it's just yeah. I can talk myself out of it very easily. Yeah, I get that. So you came across an article from Boston College about one of their alumni. I did. Oh, this made me so, so happy to see. And, and I have to say it's because I saw that one of our clip out members, Karen Cushy, is the one that posted this. Right. And uh, she posted it because it was about her husband. Sure. Uh, <laughs> Sal <laughs> Cushy. For those of you who don't know, Hisao is one of the original founders of Peloton. And he also is general counsel for Peloton. So he's in charge of very high level, all of the uh, anything legal that happens at Peloton. 
and could not be a nicer person. Like, just couldn't. He's so down to earth. He's talked to Tom and I for like a long time. Yeah. And, and they have, Karen and Hisao have two kids. We've only gotten to meet one who also works for Peloton. And she's also like one of the nicest human beings. Like, I love the Kushi family. They're just great. <laughs> yes, they're very And nice. this entire article is all about uh, how Hisao ended up at Peloton, but like his history and what makes him so unique. I mean... He's got a lot of really cool stuff that he does that you would not guess whenever I say things like general counsel, but he's really funny. Not only is he funny, but he has a great sense of humor when people are telling him things. You need to go read this article because it gives you, I think, an in-depth perspective of the kind of people that work at Peloton, which might give all of you perspective into why I am so fanatical about this company. When I say things like, no, 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 they're going to do the right thing because that's the type of people that run the company, this is what I mean. It's because I have had conversations with them individually, and I believe in them as people. They're all been super, super nice. Yes. Again, if anybody uh, wants to find that, since it's you know buried in a Boston College magazine that can be hard, hard to track down, you can find it in the newsletter that we'll send out this week that you can sign up for at theclipout.com. Yes. So our Stronger You Challenge came to a close, lasted a it little did. less amount of time than our bingo challenge. <laughs> just just a smidge. <laughs> Which I think somewhere is still going on. <laughs> I Sur- hope not. Surprise, it's a coverall. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the winner was Dane Newman. Yes, and uh, so that means Dane won 12-week subscription to Stronger You Nutrition, which is a $449 value. And Dane could not have been more excited. He's been wanting to try Stronger You. He loves everything about Peloton. And he was super excited. So also couldn't be a nicer person. Reached out to me, said thank you. He was just so, so great about it. And thank you for all of you who saw my post on Facebook and Instagram and congratulated Dane because there were like there were a bunch of you playing the game. So that was cool. Yeah, it was nice to have so many people enter. And fear not, we have another contest slash challenge in the works with another wonderful prize. And uh, we will have more information on that in the coming weeks. But sit tight. I think everyone will be super excited about the next one. Yes. Yeah. You kind of had that John Foley giddiness starting to happen. Oh, did I? Yeah, just a little bit. Listen to me. And then our (laughs) our next prize is very super sexy. (laughs) <laughs> it is <laughs> In sad news It's not sad actually Really? I, I think, think a it's lot good. of people would be very upset about this Yeah, I'm going to say Either way, it's okay It's, <laughs> it's uh, alright Dennis cut his hair Yes, I don't know if any of you have seen the pictures Where he was flinging it around For the camera when it was at its longest But I mean, he had a good Two feet of hair on that head. And uh, he decided the other night, very appropriately, for the very first reset class that he did, the kickoff, he cut his hair just before the class. What a reset, indeed. That is a reset. Yeah. Well, uh, it was awesome. So how how are people doing with this? What's the take? I know that uh, a lot of ladies and probably some men were big fans of of his hair. Yeah, I mean, he's got great hair, but he also is adorable. So it's it's OK. You know what I mean? Like, it's a good thing either way. And unfortunately, there are a lot of women that objectify poor Dennis, <laughs> actually <laughs> poor Dennis's girlfriend, because I'm sure she gets really tired of it. But he is such a good hearted person. Uh, you know, he doesn't play into all of that. So I'm glad for him that, that either way, everyone is supportive of his hair choices. So there are some new classes and artist series and content coming out over the next couple days. Yeah, a bunch of new stuff. First up, we have the next artist series, which is the Philly Soul Artist Series. So that's going to include things like the OJs, the Spinners, Teddy Pendergrass, Patti LaBelle, Lou Rawls, the Delphonics. And you're going to get to do a 30 minute spin class with Jen Sherman. That's going to be on February 6th. And Kristen McGee Yoga Flow on the 10th uh, at 730 p.m. Eastern. And then, oh, I guess that's all. It's just a ride and flow this time. So that's going to be really, really fun. That's going to be awesome. Gotcha. And we should say that uh, those are examples of Philly Soul. We're not necessarily promising you that all those artists will be in there. But those are like, that's what Philly Soul is. If people weren't familiar with it, it's kind of like 
the way I normally describe it is it's like stuff that you thought was Motown that wasn't actually Motown, Philly soul. Yeah, that's a really good way to do it. Yeah. And also, I have a great picture of me and the spinners. Okay, well, you'll have to you'll have to give it to me before I send out the newsletter this week so that I can include it in the newsletter, Tom. Because they wear like all it's all of them in like these pink suits. Oh, my oh. God. I remember that. And then there you are. In there the I am. Oh, <laughs> spinners are like I was it was a show I did was the OJs and the spinners and the OJs are great. And I know they're technically the bigger band, but the spinners, man, that's my jam. Anyway, <laughs> and then uh, and then there's also a new class content coming. Yes. So then there's going to be a whole new yoga content. It's called Yoga Slow Flow. Anna Greenberg is kicking this one off and it's going to be um, tonight at 730 p.m. Eastern. So February 5th. So go check it out, because obviously when you listen to this, it will have already happened. But the cool thing is, is that for people who are new to yoga or maybe you aren't new to yoga, but you just need more time to get in a position. This is the class for you. Because it's able to take it at a little bit of a slower pace. So she Anna is doing the first one, but they're going to be doing these with all the different instructors. So there will be more to come. Awesome. And now I got that Beastie Boy song stuck in my head. When you say slow flow, I want to be like slow and flow. That is the tempo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that one. Oh, well, sorry. Uh, sorry. We'll have to listen to more Beastie Boys then. OK, I'm OK with that. So and then there's uh, just a reminder for a new class that's out there. Yes. um, Another new kind of content. It's a new time for UK. So 7 p.m. UK time, 2 p.m. Eastern, there's going to be a new class. And so this was going to be a 45 minute interval and arms ride. And it was going to be from Leanne Hainsby. So that's awesome to have a whole new time on the bike that you can take live. Absolutely. So there's a uh, a half marathon coming up in March in New York, right? Yeah, it's called the New York City Half Marathon. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> but the cool thing is, is that, you know, this Peloton community is amazing. There are a ton of Peloton people who did not win a lottery. And after watching Brittany Runs Marathon, you know what that means. They had, sure. to, they had to find a different way in. So they formed a team. And they are going to be raising money for charity. And they picked this whole Peloton team, picked the multiple myeloma. And it affects some of the members within the team. There's family members within the team that have multiple myeloma. And so they had a goal of raising $9,000 so they could all be at the marathon. They have exceeded that. And they just wanted the entire Peloton community to know. We want the entire Peloton community to know, especially if you're going to be out there and you're in New York, and you're able to cheer them on, go see them and find all of your Peloton teammates out there. Awesome. And then lastly, we had someone reach out to us who has started a new uh, Peloton Facebook tribe and wanted you to mention it. Yeah. So we have a new tribe that just popped up in South Carolina, and it is the Pelo GSP tribe. So they are looking for Pelotoners in the upstate area of South Carolina. So that's the Greenville and Spartanburg area. They want to extend to Clemson and Anderson and other local communities. So they're very, very new. They only have uh, 50 members because they just started. Sure. But uh, they are super excited for more members. They know there's some out there. So they wanted to mention it here to see if anybody wanted to join. And that was uh, by Monica Amburn Kimbrell sent that in. Awesome. Checking in with the Peloton community. So uh, joining us today via Skype phone is Amy Farber. Hey, Amy, how's it going? Fine, thanks. How are you? We're good. Yeah. Good. Do you have a sweet government job? You're off today, too? I have a work from home on my own business job. So, ah. yes, I'm off when I want to be off and I'm on when I want to be on. <laughs> that is even sweeter than a sweet government <laughs> job. Well, if you have your own yeah. business, sometimes you're on when you don't want to be on. Uh, not necessarily. I'm a photographer, so I don't take okay. projects when I know <laughs> okay. I can't do them. <laughs> My parents both own businesses. So like sometimes it was like, oh, they were going to work whether they wanted to or not. <laughs> right. People think it's this panacea and it is not. OK, let me clarify. When you're not paying the bills and you own your own business, you can kind of do what you want. <laughs> Well, it's nice to be in a position where you, you don't have the pressure of paying the bills and you can tell people who irritate you to F off. <laughs> yes, that is exactly right. Yeah, it's been nice. 
So tell us how you originally found Peloton. So I was a spin instructor for a solid 15 years. I got certified Johnny G certification when I want to say when my oldest was a baby. I have two kids. I have a 19 year old, an 18 year old and a 14 year old. And so I spent most of their, or I should say they spent most of their childhood in gym daycares <laughs> when I was <laughs> teaching. Um, and I did it, you know, because I needed to get out of the house and I wanted to exercise. And I just thought it would be great to get daycare for free and get paid to exercise. So I taught spin for a, quite a long time. So my, the last spin class I taught was probably seven years ago. Okay. Um, okay. And then... Actually, it was kind of right after I got sober was the last class that I taught. And then I kind of went through this big transition and I just couldn't set foot in a gym. Like every time I tried to go take a class or go work out, I was like, oh, no. So then fast forward to Peloton coming out. Now, let me just backpedal and say that I did own my own Johnny G spin bike. Okay. When the kids were really little, I really wanted it. My husband got it for me for Christmas, and it was a perfect clothes rack. Um, <laughs> it sat there, and I was like, this is horrible. Like, I don't want to teach myself my own class. Like, I just – I couldn't motivate myself. Like, I could motivate others as I was teaching. And then I tried it while I was watching TV. I was like, no, this is pointless. And then I used it to try to distract myself from laundry, and I couldn't even distract myself – from loads and loads of laundry. I would rather fold laundry than sit on a spin bike by myself so in my house. So there's an upside, though. <laughs> <laughs> the laundry's done. That's, the laundry got done. Let's um, not discount the importance of that. Correct, correct. So fast forward to Peloton coming out. And I did think to myself, yeah, I don't know that that's my thing. I always was one that if I went to a gym, I was very motivated. But every time I tried to work out at home, not so much. I would get distracted by the tiniest thing and then just walk away from my workout. Well, it's kind of fascinating that like you could be an instructor and do it. But like when it came time for you to be on the bike as a participant. Yeah, not so much. Not so much. What, just, what, yeah, just... alone um, in my house without any specific training program. I was fine running outside. And at the time I was doing triathlons and I had a coach. And so I had a prescribed workout and she'd tell me, go do, run this far and blah, 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 do these kind of sprints. And then I had all the training I was doing was outdoor on the bike and I was totally fine outside. But the minute I came inside to try to work out with my kids all around me and the distractions of being a mom with three little kids, it was like, forget it. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Just, I find it, like I said, I just find it fascinating that you would do it professionally, but for yourself, I'm just like, thank God you're not a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> How bad would your I, teeth I have be? No teeth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I, so Peloton came out and I thought, you know what? I just don't think that this is for me. Like I'm a gym, you know, I'm a fitness person that needs to be in a gym. I'm very motivated by what's going on around me. Even if nobody's looking at me, I tend to run faster, go harder. But, you know, if it's like, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and nobody hears it, did it even fall? That's how I felt about <laughs> working out at home. Like no one's paying attention to me. So I might as well just get off and do laundry. Huh. <laughs> I wonder if like tracking it all with like Garmin would help, you know, because like it, it's not really a workout if you're not tracking it with Garmin. Correct. So at the time, so this was even longer. I mean, this has got to be like 14 years ago or 13 years ago. Garmin. So there were no metrics. There was no real way to track yourself on a Johnny G spin bike. It was just like your stock standard gym spin bike that had a resistance knob. But I want to say we didn't even there was no digital anything to it. Right. Right. I've seen those. So, yeah. Yeah. So obviously technology has changed. But so circle back to Peloton, I saw it and thought, yeah, that's great. I mean, who knows what'll happen with that? I just don't think that that's a route I'm going to go. I know myself and I know that working out at home is just not for me. And right. then a good friend of mine who's a, you know, that I met through, she lives in my town and I actually met her through Instagram and she got a Peloton and she was all into it. So she kept roping me into going into the showroom to go ride with her. Okay. <laughs> so okay. I had the app 
this is probably, I got the app maybe three years ago Okay. and I would go into my gym and do the rides on the spin bikes at an off time when there wasn't a class. And I did enjoy that. And then from time to time, I'd go in with her and ride in the studio. I do her milestones with her. So I did get a sense of the bike and I thought, you know what? I think this is something that I would do. I don't think this is going to be a waste of money. Okay. So my Pelliversary is actually on Friday. Oh, um, congrats. So this time last year, it was, I don't know, one o'clock in the morning and I couldn't fall asleep. And I was like, God damn it, I'm just going to buy this bike. So I just bought it. I didn't <laughs> consult with anyone. Uh, I sent my husband a text in the morning. and was like, FYI, my Peloton's getting delivered, whatever. And he was absolutely fine with it. <laughs> That's he, didn't, he didn't point to the Johnny G bike or whatever and be like, well, what? He sold that years ago. <laughs> uh, but, but he no, has not. Like, I promise you, though, he has not forgotten. No, he's not forgotten. I mean, I got a major eye roll when I saw yeah. him. He was traveling, so he didn't get home till the following Friday, and he was like, whatever. If that's so going to make you happy, I mean, you're not going to use it, but it's fine. We'll see. So it got delivered on January 24th, which is actually my sobriety date. So it's just like a random... Look at that. Um, oh, my gosh. Yeah. So my Pelliversary is actually my sobriety date, so it got delivered on my 7th anniversary seventh year anniversary that seems fateful yeah totally fateful so i did my first ride i remember i did a 45 minute hip hop with robin and i was so happy i was like you know what this is exactly what i need for this time in my life it's just perfect wow so that's how i landed the long road from johnny g to peloton okay yeah and with and with it showing up on that date he like he really couldn't say yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. Like, as a husband, you do the quick math in your head, and you're just like, whatever that cost is cheaper than whatever this fight we're about to have is. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, this time last year, I was working a ton, and so it was kind of irrelevant. I was like, this is how I want to spend the money that I, you know, I was working on multiple different projects, and he was like, that's fine. That's great. <laughs> Enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's all you. So you do that. Forward to, I think he's actually down on the bike today, right now, for his second ride um, <laughs> of the day. And he is, we're going to the studio on Friday for my 500th ride, his century ride, my Pelliversary, and my eight year sobriety. Wow. Nice. Congratulations yeah. on all of that. So much to <sighs> celebrate. Yeah. So it'll be super fun. And he's in. I mean, he's not. He's learning how to follow people and follow them back and the high fives. And he's just kind of a year later kind of coming around on the community part of it. But he absolutely loves the workout. So no regrets. That's yeah, Tom, awesome. He has no regrets. I'm glad to hear that for him. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that you were just saying that you have your sober anniversary coming up as well. But I know you also use Peloton as a tool for sobriety and mental health. Tell us about that. So as I mentioned before, I am coming up on my eight year of sobriety and around for the first year of my sobriety, I did work out a ton and I was still teaching my regular classes. And then I just had this transition in my life. The gym was that I worked at was reworking their schedule. I was really working on my sobriety and a big part of my story surrounding alcohol was using exercise and training to avoid drinking too much, if that makes sense. So if I knew I had to go teach a class, okay, um, okay, yeah, I, I used it to kind of moderate my drinking. And like you, so it was like a, I guess I don't know if this is actually a real term, but you hear people throw it around like a functional alcoholic. That was a way to kind of keep you focused. Hundred percent. Gotcha. So okay. and it was it's kind of crazy because when you know after I quit drinking and. You know, people are like, wait, you're an alcoholic? Like, you did triathlons. And you, it's surprising, but it is a very, very common thing, especially for women, to moderate their drinking with training for something like a marathon, triathlon, something like that. Huh. So, I guess it's probably just plain armchair psychologist here, but it seems like it's probably a way to kind of like offset some of the effects as well. And like, the like, oh, here, look how healthy I am over here. So... It's okay for like that, it's, yeah, yeah that and I don't know if you've ever met any alcoholics or addicts but we are definitely all in kind of people mm. um so it's you know you kind of throw yourself into things so if I'm training then I can't drink the way I, I want to or I would if I wasn't training if I didn't have to get up and do what was on my schedule okay okay so anyhow so 
the schedule changed at the gym. There was a woman who wanted my classes and she was a single mom and had some teenage kids. And I thought, you know what, this is the right time for me to back off and figure out because I wasn't loving teaching. I was getting sober. I was working on myself and trying to figure out, I say this often, like how to live in the middle. When you have a type A personality, you're either all in or you're all out. Yep. There's yeah. no in between, right? So a big thing about getting sober was like learning how to live in the middle. Where's my middle ground? Like I middle ground was such a foreign concept to me <laughs> that I kind of had to just like step away from working out. I didn't train for anything. I actually haven't done a race since I got sober. So I took the like walk away from the gym thing almost to the extreme. It was like once I got out of the routine of working out, it was so hard to get back to it. Like hours in my week were yeah. recovered. And I was 40 at the time. So, you know, women, I do not recommend stepping away from the gym at 40 years old. Not a good. <laughs> it's so hard to get back. And it's like, yeah, no, the worst possible time. I mean, I don't know why that couldn't happen. You know, at 18, fine. You can jump right, right back in. But at 40? <laughs> ugh. Well, at 18, you don't necessarily have the... Uh mindset to yeah. be like, ah, no. oh, I think I'll get no. sober. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, I do know people that have. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. Have but yeah. So for me, so then began a seven year track of me thinking, okay, I really need to start exercising again. And I need to figure out how to make that work for me that in a positive way, and that it's going to be something I enjoy. Yeah. So I would pick up and go for a run outside. And <laughs> Not for nothing, but when you're, I don't know, 20 plus pounds heavier and 40 something and you just decide to go out for a run when you haven't run in like three years. It hurts. You, can't, you cannot run an eight minute mile. So <laughs> that was brutal. <laughs> I get home so mad. Like, So anyway, I had a really hard time figuring out how to get fitness back in my life. And it was a long, long time of starting and stopping and starting and stopping or doing it for a little while, but not really loving it, like just checking it off the list, which yeah. I was always someone who loved, I loved the process of working out. I just loved it. And I was not loving it. I felt like Oprah, you know, how Oprah always says she hates every single step and like minute of working out. She just does it to check it off a list. I yeah. never felt like that. And that's how I was starting to feel. And I thought, all right, well, maybe this is my new reality. Working out is just going to be a chore for me, something that I have to check off my list. So, But I continued to search for something that I would love. So finally, I got the Peloton. And I have to say, for the first, I don't know, I got it at the end of January. Until about mid-May, I did my rides. But I wasn't invested in, I wasn't a part of any Peloton community. I followed a couple of people that I knew in real life that had the bike, but otherwise, I just wasn't a part of anything. Yep. So I had a friend in real life who said to me, you know, what online groups are you part of? And I thought, I don't know what you're talking about. But the cra crazy thing is, is that I had spent my years as an Instagram influencer. So it's not like I'm not online, like I'm <laughs> everywhere online. I just never considered that there were all these Peloton groups. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I searched. It was so funny. I was lying in bed and my husband's next to me. I was like, you can't believe there is a Peloton group for everything. <laughs> That's true. There is. And I was reading them off to him. It was so funny. I was like, which one do you think I should join? I don't know. So I ended up finding the so Peloton Sober Riders. Among, I mean, I joined the Power Zone Pack group, which is what really kind of kickstarted my fitness because for me, it was all about training and training with purpose and whatever. So that really kind of got my mindset yeah. where in a good place to ride consistently. But in terms of mental health, the community was the thing that got me on and kept me on. Okay. And was that because you had people to ride with or was that because the connections that you made? So the connections that I made online, I someone would post in a group and say, I'm doing, a, you know, I'm celebrating a milestone. Can anyone join me? And I would try to be a part of. So I say, yes, I'll meet you on the bike, you know, strangers and whatever. And I just tried to participate and I tried to show up for other people. And through that process, I found a little sub pod of women. I have four women who we are in a group text on Facebook and we ride together every day. 
And it's been phenomenal. And what is phenomenal about it? That like you guys ride together? That the accountability, you- the fact that we're on every time we ride, we have the text, we text like the whole time. <laughs> so you feel like you're at the gym with a friend. Because yeah. We're having the same shared experience. Yeah. Because if, even if we do a ride on demand, we're like, okay, three, two, one, go. So we're all kind of at the same place at the same time. It's very much a shared experience and very social. That's awesome. That's great. That is cool. And so, so how does that help you with the sobriety and mental health aspect? So I think one of the th- hardest things about anxiety and depression is just getting on the bike, like, or getting out of bed or leaving the house or whatever it is, that's your stumbling block. And there's a whole spectrum of, you know, depression and anxiety, and it is very seasonal and it ebbs and flows. But for me, it was really hard to motivate myself to go work out when I just wasn't, I didn't feel like it. I wasn't, you know, I didn't feel great. I wasn't in a great place. And I knew mentally it would make me feel better, but it's still like putting your clothes on and doing it is another thing. Yeah. And when you commit to other people at 11 o'clock at night, that you're going to meet them on the bike at 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm not one to back out of things. Yeah. Um, So when I commit to things, I do it. So I just kept showing up. And for me, I mean, it has helped so many things. First of all, I'm in so much better shape and that has truly helped with mental health. Like just not being winded up a flight of stairs. I mean, it was getting grim, you guys. I was, (laughs) I mean, yeah, I can't reiterate enough. Do not (laughs) stop working out in your early forties. So anyway, I just feel better about myself. I feel much more like myself. I don't know. It's just, it's really, really helped me. And I think the other thing about mental health and addiction and alcoholism specifically is it is a very isolating disease. Yeah. All of all of it yeah. combined. Absolutely. My natural state is isolation. Yeah. I don't want to go to a party. I don't want to go to a spin class. And you know, I I'm more comfortable in my house by myself. Yep. So I have found for me that the combination of the accountability the community and the fact that I don't have to leave my house has been so helpful. It's almost like baby steps. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, you know, it's like you don't have to throw yourself in cold water. You can just kind of dip your toe in. Yeah, and you don't have to leave your house, but you can exercise. But you're still being social, which still makes you feel better. Correct. I mean, it's all yeah, and it's I. One of the things that I've really, really had to work on in sobriety and with my mental health is not isolating. So for me, the building community and finding my people on the bike has been such a huge part of my recovery and part of my mental health. Yeah. You know, but that's kind of like whenever people say at work, you know, find a mentor, you know, you can't really force that relationship, right? You can't force those relationships on the bike either. So, so for somebody who might be out there struggling with depression today or, or maybe some other kind of mental health issues, it seems like the hardest part is pushing past that feeling that you don't want to get up. It, how do they reach out and find people? How do so you recommend? I would they- say join a group. And there, like we said, there is a Peloton group for everything. So it doesn't have to be sobriety related, mental health related. I mean, you could I live in Boston. You can join the Peloton Boston group, but find a group that's active. And when people post and say, tomorrow I'm doing X, Y, Z ride, who's in? Just get on the bike and maybe follow the people that are on the ride. And you can kind of lurk in the background and (laughs) still be a part of a little bit and then kind of baby step your way into responding to the post and then building a rapport with the people that are in the group and the people that you like and that you feel like you have uh, some commonality with. Yeah, those are great ideas. And for um, since you do photography and you own your own business, do you... Do you feel like that that's helped the working aspect as well, keeping you more grounded and healthier to be able to do that? Because I, this, that's isolating as well when you're yeah, working I was at home. Thinking Correct. the same yeah. thing that like you when we were joking about like, oh, if I don't want to do it, I won't do it. But like that can turn into isolation real quick. Yeah. 
Correct. And I do make a point to schedule my rides out for the week. So what time am I riding riding each day and who am I going to ride with and what are we going to do? And so that creates, and then I put that in my calendar first and then I build my work around it. So I am much more productive. That's great. So, I mean, it sounds like a really key part of all of this for you is that you show up for yourself. If you make a commitment to yourself, then you follow through. Like you're not one of those people. It's like, I'm going to run tomorrow. And then you're like, you get up tomorrow morning. You're like, eh. <laughs> so, so, OK, let me let's backtrack. I think <laughs> I make a commitment to other people. If okay. I say, Crystal, I will meet you on the bike tomorrow and let's do this ride. I will not back out. If in my little head, I said, oh, maybe I'll do this ride tomorrow. And then the alarm goes off and I don't really feel like doing it. I won't. Okay. (laughs) Okay. I think for me, it's really important to be accountable to other people. And I'm very much big on follow through. But when I'm, you know, when nobody's watching, I don't know. It's It's, harder. It's easy to embrace the maybe. It is. (laughs) Oh, completely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I I do think that since I'm involved in so many groups at this point, that is something that has fallen off for me because I used to ride. I used to ride every morning at 5 a.m. my time. And that was the six o'clock crew on the East Coast. And so I kind of rode with the same people every day. But one, since now we have the treadmill content, that's kind of diluted it a little bit because I wanted to do the running as well. Right. And so there's a different group of people running. There's a different group of people biking. And so I don't have that same there's not like the same core group every day. So now I don't really right. have my go to anymore. So that has changed my focus on getting up every morning and working out. I think I've been a lot more lax since that happened. Just your point that, you know, having that accountability right. really does make a difference. So in my little pod of group message, there's five of us to have the tread and the rest of us are planning on getting the tread at some point. I think that's a bigger purchase that I might not be able to just be like, hey, I bought the tread. Yeah, but, I get that. I get that. Um, I'm strategizing that right now. Uh, <laughs> I'll let you know when, okay. that, when I drop that bomb. She's waiting um, for him to make some major purchase. And then just be like, you so know. So she can be like, no. well, if you can get that. No, it's not that at all. It's actually so he used to love running. I mean, he was a running junkie and now his hip is hurting. So I think I was so my strategy was initially going to be, well, like you love running more than biking. Let's get the tread. And now he's like, can't really run anymore Um, or right now. So I'm going to have to think through my strategy on that. I mean, just get him a quick hip replacement and, you know. (laughs) I know. And then he'll feel so old. But, um, yeah. That's the so, trade off. I get a tread, but we spend the, the equivalent money on your hip on replacement. Your hip. <laughs> and, yeah, right. Yeah, he will love that. Yeah, so, so my point is that the group that I ride with, two out of five of us have the tread as well. So we really plan our workout so that no one ever runs or rides alone. And it's so great. That's really nice. That's great. Yeah, that is cool. What a good tool. I think that would be helpful advice for people, especially who are just starting out, you know. And we are all strangers. <laughs> one's in San Diego, one's in Seattle, one's in Atlanta, one's in Chicago, and I'm in Boston. Yeah. We're on we're in different time zones. Our kids' ages are very, very different. One works full time. I and mean, we we have very we have a lot of constraints around figuring out how to make this work, but we do like we're committed to it. And we're committed to each other. That's awesome. Do you guys, you know, a lot of people say you need to have uh, rest days. Do you ever worry about not taking a day off? Oh, no, we we take day offs whenever we need it. It's very rare that all five of us will be on at the same time. Okay. Um, it's just kind of like no one rides alone. So okay. the girl who works, she has to get up and ride sometimes really early before work or after work. And we just try to make sure that someone's there for accountability so that no one blows off their workout. Got it. Okay. That's great. Yeah, that is cool. I really like that system. So it's been great. Tell us about the Peloton Sober Riders. How did you find it? How did they form? So they for I just was looking at it yesterday. They just had their one year anniversary on Facebook. Um, And it's a very like great group of people. And sobriety is so all encompassing and there are a million different ways to get sober and stay sober. And there's no one right way or wrong way. But what I found about this group is that it is so supportive no matter where you are in your journey. And it's January. So obviously not obviously, but there are a lot of new people who have kind of jumped on and we 
someone made a post and said, like, is anyone doing dry January? Where's everyone with that? Some people are thinking like, maybe I'll quit for a month and see how it goes. And so it's been going for a year, I think. So I joined back in May when I was sitting in my bed looking at all the different Peloton groups. And I was like, (laughs) okay, this one's a good fit for me. And the funny thing is I'm in another online sobriety group. And then I started getting confused. I'm like, wait, are you in my Peloton group? Are you in my <laughs> other sobriety group? And then we realized there was a bunch of crossover that a bunch of us were in both groups. Oh, that's so, funny. Yeah. So it's super supportive. And like I said, there's no one way or right way to do it. And I feel like the best thing about it is there are so many people that have different come to it from a different perspective that when someone is struggling or someone needs help or needs advice, there's always multiple points of view. And so I think that's great because I've been in other groups or in other situations when people are like, no, this is the only way to do it. And if you don't do this, you're going to drink again. And I just don't believe in that. So I feel like this group has been super supportive. That's great. Yeah, that probably has to be difficult. Like if you've been through it and, and you feel like you've come out the other side, but you're like, this is what worked. Don't ever veer from this formula. That's got to be rough for people to acknowledge that like, OK, there are there are yeah. different ways to get here. There are I, different ways to do it. And I always say to people, as Dennis says, I just make s- suggestions. You make decisions. Yeah. Um, and I can say, well, this is what worked for me. Take it or leave it. And then often if someone comes back to me multiple times and is stumbling over the same thing over and over and over again and has not tried what I suggested, I think mm, maybe Not that there's one way to do it, but you haven't found your way. So maybe try what I suggested. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that I tend to be the kind of person that if like I'm giving advice, I'm more than happy to help somebody. But like if they if they don't take that advice, then I tend to get a little frustrated. I don't think I'd be good at helping people with this type of thing because I am in like a box. I'm very black and white. Like if this worked, then this won't work, you know? If I'm talking to the same kind of person as me, that's true. But I acknowledge there's lots of other people out there (laughs) that are not like me. (laughs) It's so true. And I think so I I have gotten sober through a 12 step program. And in that program, we sponsor other people. And in the beginning, I was like, you know, she's not doing what I say. She's out. (laughs) Um, And then I've learned, like I said, like I make the suggestions and if they they can take it or leave it. And it's honestly none of my business and whether they take it and succeed or take it and fail. It's It's not not, on you. It's not on me. And I always say to people, I am here. Like, don't ever feel like just because you failed or you didn't take my advice. I am here for you, you know, no matter what. So keep coming back. I will never judge you on your decisions. I just want you to be able to get better. That's awesome. And that's how it should be. You know, like, that's why I say I would not be good at it. Just to be right. clear, like that, <laughs> that is the way to do it. Not the way I would, you would do learn. it. You would learn. Because if you get, I mean, all it takes is getting too emotionally invested in someone else's sobriety that you have no control over. And then all of a sudden they relapse and you can't leave your room because you feel like it's all your fault or you've taken it on so greatly that you would learn. It all it takes is one time. It happens to the best. Like every single one of us has been through that at least one time. And then you learn. Yeah. I guess it's, it's in some ways, it's kind of like how how doctors won't treat family members. Like you you get too close to it. You got it. You need to have some degree of separation. Separation. Of separation. Yeah. 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 You just need to be able to compartmentalize that I've done my best and I've given them the tools and whether or not they take them is their their choice. But So the best thing about the group is that there's men, there's women, there's all different ages, different people at varying stages of sobriety. There's a bunch of people in our group that have been sober over 25 years, which is phenomenal. Wow. Um, Yeah. And so I always find that that is super helpful because those people always have like little gems of wisdom. Sure. What's the hashtag for this group that they that you ride together? There's two. (laughs) There's two sober groups. I'm in both of them. The one that I tend to participate more is Peloton Sober Riders. We do not have a hashtag. Okay. Um, There's no location or anything for it. The other group is the Peloton Alcohol Free. I have to look it up. Okay. Okay. I was wondering what, because that's the one with the hashtag, as I see that one. That's hashtag AF. Okay. So that's so funny because people in the group are like, oh, I thought it was as F. Right. Yeah. 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 Alcohol Free. I did. Um, Definitely thought that's what was happening. (laughs) 
you say you gravitate to one over the other. What do you find is the is the big difference or what's the driver there for you? So for me, and this is just my own personal experience that I think you cannot drink. There's a huge difference between not consuming alcohol and being sober. Mm. Sobriety is a lifestyle and sobriety in sobriety. You're constantly working on yourself because if you just remove alcohol from the equation, you're taking away medication and not figuring out a solution. Okay, so like yeah. what they refer to as like a dry drunk, somebody who okay, has it, correct. Okay, or, or white knuckling it. Yeah, you haven't yeah. fixed the or, issues. Or going on the marijuana maintenance plan, or you okay. know, alcohol free is purely alcohol free, right? Um, okay, gotcha. to gotcha. me, yeah, I've been alcohol free for a while, but I'm also sober. Like I don't put anything in my body that I think will be mind altering because I don't want to go back to that place where I'm dependent upon things to ease my anxiety. And at the time I was thinking that it was helping my depression, but Lord, was I wrong. But, um, (laughs) you know, drinking alcohol for depression is like pouring gas on a fire. Yeah. 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 If anyone didn't know that, but it's it's actually a depressant. It's actually a depressant. And a lot of people don't know that. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. (laughs) So for me, I gravitate to the sober riders because of the term sobriety in there. And people are focused on recovery as opposed to abstinence. Okay, I got that. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. I could see that. And, and that's a great way to explain it to the community because there's some people that are looking for alcohol free and that suits their purposes. But there are some people that are looking for sobriety. So thank you right. for explaining there, the difference. There are people in the alcohol free group who simply don't drink because they don't enjoy it, which is mind baffling to me. Like I can't relate <laughs> to that at all. So <laughs> um, I feel like everyone in the Peloton Sober Riders is coming from a similar place. Okay. Um, and a reason for why they are sober and why they don't consume alcohol or other drugs. And that makes sense. I mean, because yeah, if, if you've struggled with that and you're around someone who Who's like, oh, I don't drink either, but it's because they don't like the taste. Like, I'll say it for right, you. I, you probably want to yeah. punch that person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like, and why are you in a Peloton alcohol free group? That's weird right. to me. Like, right. That's like that's somebody know, people being. People who don't like coconut wouldn't be. I don't know. It's just weird. No, like, I, you don't you, like it. That's you know a great I mean? example. Yeah. 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 It's like, why would you? Yeah. It, you're not working toward avoiding it. You're just you don't like it. That's so I'm, and I'm in both groups and right. I have to and I have to say part of sobriety is service and it's MLK day. So I'll give a plug for service. But yeah. one of the things for me about staying sober and my mental health is I can't keep it if I don't give it away. So helping other people is a big part of my journey. And so being in that alcohol free group, I always feel like there's someone in there that's struggling that may need to hear my story or may need a little nugget from me. Okay. And I'm sure that's not true. All people in the alcohol free group know about the sober riders. And yeah. you know, it's, it depends upon what group you find first and where you are and whatever. So that's yeah. why I participate in both. That's, that's a great yeah. reason. And, a great- and, and I'm sure it's a helpful group just from the standpoint of alcohol is so permeated our culture that it, a lot of people talk about it so casually that it's synonymous with a party or a celebration to where even if there are people who aren't struggling in the alcohol free group, at least, you know, you can go to a place where somebody's not like talking about just casually having a beer or whatnot. Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm saying that properly. I understood. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. And the crazy thing that we talk about a lot in these groups is how many leaderboard names yes. involved wine or beer. Yeah. yeah, Jen Sherman alcohol, says that every or week. Or vodka or, yeah, it's crazy to me. And I just, when I'm riding and I see that, I think to myself, thank God that's not me. Because that was so me before I got sober. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah. I mean, I've never struggled with an addiction to alcohol or drugs, but I mean, I feel like food is an addiction for me and I Absolutely. struggle with that every yeah. day. <laughs> <laughs> So and that can be a difficult one, like not to like have comparisons, but it's like, but, but you, you have to eat. You can stop drinking. Yeah. Right. But you can't stop eating. Can't it's, stop eating. you know, yeah. no, like if, if you're struggling with alcohol, nobody's suggestion is going to be you should stop drinking except for three times a day. Drink an appropriate amount. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. It's, true. Yeah. Wow. 
Yeah, it's just, it's kind of fascinating. And I think it's interesting that when people come into those groups, they're like, wow, I can't even believe how many people on the leaderboard have, you know, names that involve alcohol. Yeah, there's a lot. That's for sure. And how is the best way for people to find these groups? Like, should they just search for the names? So they're not secret groups. They are private groups, but not secret groups. So they can search for Peloton Sober Riders. Awesome. Or you can find me on Facebook, Amy Russell Farber, and send me a DM and I can point you in the right direction. That's great. I really think that it's wonderful that um, part of the sobriety is service because I remember um, when Lori Besden was on, she said the same thing, that that's just part of what you do. And I... I think that that makes a lot of sense that what you're giving away is also keeping you. I feel like it keeps you grounded. I feel like it keeps you in the moment of your sobriety. And Absolutely. And when I am helping someone who is in the early days, it reminds me how far I've come. And it reminds me, wow, I do not want to go back to yeah. feeling like that because getting sober is one of the hardest things you can do. It's so simple, right? Just cut out alcohol. But it is not easy. And so when I'm helping someone else at various stages of sobriety, it does remind me like, wow, I remember when I used to feel like that. And it's a miracle that I don't feel that way anymore. What was the moment for you where you were like, enough's enough. I'm, I'm going to do this. Oh, man. So probably, so I have three boys, three teenage boys. And after my youngest was born, I definitely struggled a bit with postpartum depression. And I noticed that my drinking increased after he was born. My husband travels for work. So I kind of chalked it up to being like single mom during the week and just getting through, you know, I'd reward myself at night with, you know, put everyone to bed and pour a glass of wine or whatever. And, um, you know, and as the years progressed, I was like, ugh, like, I don't really love the way that this makes me feel, but I was kind of still doing it. And so they call, you know, drinking without your own permission kind of thing. And it was years and years of that thinking like, I really this is not great. And I can see where this is going. You know what I mean? Like people, I've never had a DUI. I've never been in jail. I've never gotten fired from a job or blah, blah, blah. Like as they say, I'm a high bottom drunk. But at the same time for me, it was like how I felt in the inside. I'd wake up and just feel gross. Yeah. Not even physically gross, like mentally gross. Like why can't you wake up in the morning and say, I'm not going to drink today. And then the next thing you know, you're waking up and you've drank another bottle of wine. Like what's wrong with this equation? So anyway, eight years ago, this was a thought that I had had like almost every day. I just need to quit. And I was like, oh, you know, it's always like, I'll quit tomorrow. I'll quit tomorrow. I'll quit tomorrow. And um, yeah, on a Wednesday night, I went out with some girlfriends and I don't even know what happened. My husband travels. He usually comes home on Thursday and I had had a babysitter for the kids. And I went out on a Wednesday night to have dinner with friends and I... I don't know what, like, I just was out of my mind drunk. My husband ended up coming home early. So I was trying to like brush my teeth and whatever. And I came out of the bathroom and he was standing in the bedroom and I was like, oh, shit. (laughs) Um, And because I was just out of my mind. Um, And then I proceeded to vomit the entire night, sleep on the bathroom floor, basically in a pile of my own puke. And... Then, (laughs) to add insult to injury, I ended up with the norovirus. So (gasps) the worst hangover of my life on top of the norovirus. Oh, my God. You know, so a week went by and I hadn't drank. And I just thought, you know what? This is it. I'm never doing that again. I was mortified because he had never really seen me like that. I was very in control on the weekends. And it was I was, you know, the mom that was home alone. Gotcha. Um, And... Yeah, I think like people always say it's like the grace of God and blah, blah, blah. But I truly feel like that was my moment. And I felt like I needed to take it. Well, good for you for recognizing that and doing it. I mean, it's even when you have a moment like that, it's still hard to be like, and I'll never do that again. Yeah. I mean, it was like I had a calendar and I'll remember I just had a black Sharpie and I just kept crossing days off the calendar. So I was like, okay, a week two weeks, three weeks, you know, and then on and on and on. I was like, you know what? I don't think I'm ever going back. Wow. So did you go to a 12 step into a 12 step program right away? Or did you get some time under your belt, just kind of muscling your way through? And then finally, we're like, now I'm going to do that. Okay. So I was thinking about this today. It took me an entire year to get to a 12 step program. Cause I remember I went to my first meeting the day after Martin Luther King day. 
And I got sober January 24th. So it was like the following January 20th or okay. you know, whatever. And I was miserable. I mean, I lost so much weight because the anxiety was through the roof. I had learned at 39 years old that I was self-medicating with alcohol. You would have think that like a well-educated <laughs> woman would have known that. But no, I had really had no idea. I had no, it was so, such a part of the cultural norm. Yeah. The, and it probably, the mommy drink culture. Yeah. That. And it probably creeped up on you. Like you, I think a lot of times with mental health, it, it starts to get worse as you age. And so like if you started self-medicating fairly young when it wasn't that bad and then you remove the medicine and now all you got left is that. That hurts. Oh my God. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm so, sure, sure it was ahead. rough. Yeah. Yeah, it was rough. So I literally was living on air. Like I was so anxious. I couldn't even eat anything. <laughs> like it was, and I didn't, I didn't really connect the two. Oh. Um, I mean, this is kind of crazy, but I remember... I had about six or seven months under my belt and I had gone to teach a spin class and I came out of that class with an elephant on my chest. My anxiety was through the roof and I wasn't sure what to do. And back at the time, I'd had a babysitter who worked for me and she had noticed that I was losing so much weight and she knew that I stopped drinking. And she had said to me, you know, my mom could probably really help you. Oh. And I was like, well, who's your mom? What? <laughs> and she was like, well, my mom doesn't drink and hasn't drank in like 26 years. And I think she could really help you. And she's like, if you ever need her, here's your number, just call her. And I'm like, that is the weirdest thing I've ever heard in my life. I am <laughs> never doing that. That's, who would do that? I First of all, I hate talking on the phone. Uh, <laughs> but so I came out of teaching the spin class and I was sitting in the drive in the parking lot of the gym and the anxiety was so bad and I could not figure out what was causing it. And so I, there I was like seven months sober and I Googled anxiety and alcohol <laughs> <laughs> and I learned. And of course, you know, the number for AA popped up and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I took my medication away. So anyway, I ended up calling her mom. I, I have no idea. How, I still to this day would never, ever do that. So again, like <laughs> you divine did, intervention. Yeah, you yeah. did what you needed to do. Right. And she like met me the next day. And this is hilarious because she was like, OK, well, I go to meetings. And, and I was like, meetings? Like, I have three young kids. Like, I do not have time for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And so I didn't end up going to a meeting until that following. So that was maybe in August. And it took me to the following January to get desperate enough to like, I was so uncomfortable in my own skin, just not drinking and crossing days off the calendar that I was like, okay, I'm ready. So I went to my first meeting um, right before my one year sobriety. Wow. Wow. Good for you. Yeah. I mean, you know, Tom and I have made comments before about like Tom's ex-wife and stuff. And but in all seriousness, you know, she literally has mental health, health issues and she she really does have addiction issues. And to this day, you know, one of the things that concerns us the most is that she's never done any kind of actual treatment. You know, she just stopped doing the drug. And right. and so it really to your point that you need to work on the issues that cause the addiction in the first place. And it's like I can't even imagine what goes through your head to justify or convince yourself you do or don't need to go. But I really congratulate you on having the ability to go, even though you didn't so want I to. I think it's like you don't know what you don't know. I had no idea what went on in those meetings. In my head, it was a bunch of people who lived under a bridge that sat around and smoked and drank coffee. Like I knew not, I just didn't think I knew anyone who was sober. I didn't think I knew anyone for sure, there was no one that looked like me that was sober. Okay. I, yeah. No, I get so that. That makes sense. All of a sudden, my babysitter's mom meets me at Dunkin' Donuts. And I'm like, wow, she kind of looks like me. All right. This isn't that crazy that I went. And that's a huge difference, too, between being alcohol free and being sober. Because I was miserable alcohol free. Like that is not a life for me. I need to figure out how to live without alcohol. And do you think that going through the steps changed that for you? Or do you think that like getting your mind in just a healthier place in general did that I for you? Getting my mind in a healthier place. And when you go to meetings and you listen to other people talk about their experiences and you can relate to their experiences, you think, OK, I'm not that crazy. I'm yeah. not that much of an outlier because we all think it's only me. Like I'm the only person on the planet that feels this way or has experienced this or whatever. 
And then, so I used, I would listen specifically to the women at the meetings who were talking. And then I would listen to what their solution was. Like, how did they get through that time? And I basically just started doing what they had said. I, okay. I did what they did. And that kind of made you get to a healthier place by taking those steps. Absolutely. I mean, it's crazy to be 39 or 40. I was 40 at the time and I felt like a child. I was like, why didn't anyone teach me how to live like this? It was just crazy. Yeah. What do you think the biggest thing is? Like the thing that you struggled with that that you you took a step? Like what was that thing? So I think... It's so crazy because one of the biggest things that I didn't like about the 12-step program is I thought it was religious or whatever. But I think learning that I did not have to be in control of every single situation in my life was such a relief to be able to like step back and they say like rely on a higher higher power and take or leave that language. But for me, it was all about like, phew, I do not need to be the ringmaster. Like I don't need, you know, if Crystal is doing your errands in a way that is zigzagging across the town and not in an orderly (laughs) way. I do not need to tell Crystal that she could be doing it more efficiently. (laughs) Crystal does. (laughs) (laughs) Why I was taking on everyone else's burden. Sure. sure. You know, and when I realized that, like, just worry about yourself, like. It was very freeing for you. So freeing. Yeah. And just take responsibility for your actions and. When you're only worrying about yourself, it's easier to take responsibility for your own actions because you don't have everyone else's problems swirling through your head. So true. Yeah. Yeah. So true. (laughs) Well, thank you for sharing all of that. Absolutely. (laughs) I've made this joke to you before, but I'm always like, we'll always know if my ex-wife ever goes to a 12-step program because... Until the day she apologizes, she clearly hasn't. <laughs> right. True. Uh, yeah. And to her kids. That's yes. Most yeah. importantly. More importantly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Totally. Yeah. It's like, it's, you know, the best thing about any sort of group, 12 step program or group of sober people is that the way that they live their life is very honest and pure and owning, you know, even in the day when you maybe do something during the day that you think at night, like, oh, I could have done that better. Like, just kind of. Stepping back and thinking, like, how could I do better? How can I do better tomorrow? How can I be a better person? How can I be a better mom? How can I be nicer? Whatever. Well, I like that reflection. And yeah. I think I think regardless of whether or not a person has had addiction issues or not, that everybody could stand a little self-reflection in that. <laughs> All true, of us could think true, about true, that. True. <laughs> and I think the thing, too, was when you get sober, someone was saying in this in our sober group, is like the best thing about Peloton in early sobriety is that you end up having a lot of free time in your hands that you don't know what to do with. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because if you are drinking at night, that kind of consumes every night and all of a sudden you're sober and your mind is reeling and you're like, Oh my God, what am I going to do? I actually, in that first year of sobriety would get in my car and drive to the gym at six 30 at night after I fed my kids just to get out of the house and have something to do. But having a bike in a community right in your own house, it's such a good way to kind of get healthy and keep your mind off of other things. That yeah, is an bet. excellent point. Yeah. 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 So, so uh, what is your leaderboard name? My leaderboard name is Chasing Amy, but with two Ys, because Chasing Amy with one Y was taken. (laughs) Damn that movie. (laughs) That movie's awesome. I take that back. (laughs) So uh, do you have any advice for newbies, not just Peloton newbies, but maybe people who are just getting sober or seriously contemplating it? My biggest advice is to... Find some people, a couple people who are sober that you admire and do what they do. Ask them questions. Just listen. And newbie Peloton riders, I would say, jump in, get involved, join a group. That's what they say about AA. Join a group. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. It's true for Peloton, too. I, I firmly believe the more you put in to this community, the more you get back. Absolutely. And it's not about the exercise because I can find that anywhere. And the thing that keeps me going back day after day after day is the community. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, where can people find you on social media? I'm assuming you would like to be found because you mentioned. Sure. Yeah. So on Instagram, I am Amy Russell Farber and the same on Facebook. Awesome. Wonderful. 
It's good for branding. It nice is. and simple. It is. Great for branding. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us. Yes. Thanks. And also, thank you for sharing your story. I know yes. it's very personal and uh, we appreciate your honesty. And I know, I just know that it's going to help somebody else out there. So, or maybe you know, several. I think it's really timely. I don't know if you guys saw Kendall on Instagram recently. This week did a whole thing on mental health and how it's nothing to be ashamed of. And, you know, I think the more we get the dialogue out about mental health in general, addiction, alcoholism, I think more people will be able to find themselves and get out of a hole. I have no doubt. I think it's a great conversation to be having. Absolutely. All right. Well, Well, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You have a good rest of your day. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. So uh, I guess that brings a another one to a close. What pray tell do you have in store for people next week? We have the vibrant and and exciting Nicole Amara. I think I'm saying her name right. She is the admin of the You Get To tribe, which is the tribe for Just Sims on the tread. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, I guess until then, where can people find you? People can find me at Facebook.com slash Crystal D. O'Keefe. They can find me on Twitter, Instagram, the bike, and of course, the tread at Clip Out Crystal. And you can find me on Twitter at Roger Kubert or on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Tom O'Keefe. You can find the show online at Facebook.com slash The Clip Out while you're there. Like the page, join the group. And of course, don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcast so you never miss an episode. And sign up for our newsletter at theclipout.com so you can get all the show notes and links and all that sort of stuff. A picture of me and the spinners. You know you want to see that. (laughs) Sent directly to your inbox. So I guess that's it for this one. Thanks for tuning in. And until next time, keep peddling. And running. Clip in. Clip out.